the same time, something that affects our life every single day. Um, you've done this this morning. You may have done it five times this morning. You may have done it ten times this morning. Um, but it is something that is vital for our survival on the earth. And it's also vital to make sure that we end up where we want to go, right? Which is heaven. Amen? And what we're going to talk about today is decisions. But uh, not just decisions. So, nothing's working today. Okay, hit you, show. Okay, so, for taking notes, this is your title today. Deciding to make decided decisions diligently. Alright, if you're taking notes, this is a nightmare. Or in other words, you can just write decisions. <laughs> I just want it to be complicated. Alright, so, um, y'all know the game Wheel of Fortune? Yes? You guys know the Wheel of, game of Wheel of Fortune? So in the game of Wheel of Fortune, you'll have players that would come and they would try to win it big. Right? That's the whole point of coming onto Wheel of Fortune. So, uh, as contestants or as players, you'd come on and you would hope to walk away with large sums of money. You would hope to walk away with a car uh, or maybe a luxury trip to an exotic location. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of the game, you'll see that they'll be spinning the wheel and wherever it lands, it lands, right? They have no choice. They have no control over it. But they're hoping that it lands on something good, right? And then when it lands on, say, 300 bucks or 500 bucks or whatever it is, uh, then they rely on their knowledge to find out what the puzzle is, right? And us watching from home, we try to figure out what the puzzle is as well, right? And then if you watch the show, you would know that whoever wins the first two or three rounds will go on to a bonus round. And in the bonus round, uh, they have a table with 20 envelopes, right? And they get to pick an envelope before they play the last round. So depending on how they do in the last round, if they win the last round, they'll win whatever's in that envelope, right? Now that envelope can contain a million bucks, it can contain a car, it can contain a, uh, a trip of some kind, right? But the thing is that they have absolutely no control over what they're deciding, right? They just pick it and they hope that it's something good, right? And see, our life could be like this. See, life is full of the need to make decisions. Right? And we want to make the right decision, and we want to pick the right envelope, because we know that if we make the right decision, then that means our life is going to be better off than being worse. Right? Um, and sometimes we get choices that, you know, in our lives, and, and a lot of the things that happen to us uh, do seem random sometimes. So, you know, when we're faced with a decision, we try to use the information around us, right? Uh, all the information that we have at our disposal to make the right decision, right? Based on what we know. And when we make a decision, if you think about it, you're trying to predict the outcome, right? When you make a decision, you're hoping that we'll land at the spot we're aiming for, right? And then, uh, you know, some decisions might be quite small, you know, uh, whenever uh, my wife goes to Tim Hortons, you know, will it be ice cap or French vanilla, right? It's a big dilemma, right up until the last moment, she doesn't tell me. Um, you know, and then, or, you know, will I choose Bell or Rogers as my internet provider, right? These aren't going to really affect your life that much. Maybe the French vanilla. Um, and then there's some more moderately important, which is, you know, will I give up eating ice cream so that I don't gain weight? Or, you know, will I go and play sports or spend my time at home on the internet or playing PlayStation, right? They're a little bit important. And then we have really decisive, crucial life direction decisions, right? Will I get married? Uh, what career will I aim for? Will I listen to advice for my future or am I going to wing it on my own, right? And, you know, sometimes we have to face some of these small, everyday, for the moment sort of choices and sometimes we have to make some big, life-changing choices. Amen? And, you know, uh, the interesting thing is that some people seem to think that they can avoid making decisions altogether and just drift along with life, right? You guys remember Lion King? Remember Timon and Pumbaa's phrase? Say it together. <laughs> All right, so, um, Akuna Matata, 
right? If you watch The Lion King, you know that they sang a big song over this. Um, and basically, their the life philosophy is no worries. They just eat whenever they want to eat, they do whatever they want to do, and they don't care, right? And what's sad is that some people, you might be even sitting here, who are going through a life like this, right? And you don't want to face choices. You don't want to make those hard decisions, right? Sometimes you let someone else make those decisions for you. Sometimes you run away from them. Or you choose not to make the decision at all and just walk away, right? Uh, the fact that you've decided to live your life that way is actually a choice in itself, right? You made a decision that you won't make decisions, right? Hakuna matata, it means no worries, right? You are making a decision to not think about what you want to do in life, a decision to give to all the forces that are in work around you in the world and let them rule over you, right? Remember the Bible says, don't be like the leaf that just blows this way and that way, right? And then in the tag at the bottom, it says, Akuna Matata, no, I'm just All right, um, so, Akuna Matata means nothing but trouble, okay? Because those forces that are around you can hang over us and get us into some terrible messes. Amen? So, um, you know, as Christians, we have accepted that making our own decisions and ignoring God in our lives is not the way we want to live, right? We have turned to Jesus as our Lord and Savior, accepting Him because He has accepted us and has taken us into His relationship, into a friendship, and into His family. Amen? And as a result we have decided to follow him, right? So this means that when we are faced with a decision, we will want to make the right decision, the best decision, the decision that is consistent with us being followers of Christ, amen? So, the big question that sits before us today is this. How do we know whether we are making the best decisions? How do we find and follow God's guidance in our lives? I mean, we want to obey God's will, but how do we know what His will for us actually is? Right? Um, even David cried out to God for direction. So I want to read that. It's on the screen. Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me your truth and teach me. You are my God and Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Amen. Sorry. Um, now, there's a life, there's a, there's a fact to life, okay? And I want you to tell your neighbor this. God promises to guide us. Come on, tell your neighbor that. And emphasize the word promises so that they really know. God promises to guide us, okay? Amen? And if we look in the word of God, we'll find that that is true. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Someone want to read that? In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Amen. Next verse, Isaiah 58, verse 11. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 5. Amen. Now, have you ever said that you're too stupid to talk to God? Right? Or I've done too many sins to talk to God? I'm a failure in the eyes of God. How will God tell a person like me what to do? Right? It's right there in the verse. He generously, come on, say it together, generously. He generously gives to who? All. Amen? So tell your neighbor he's talking about you. Okay? He gives to all without finding fault. Amen? So tell the person beside you that you got it. All you got to do is ask. Amen? Because if you look at the verse, it starts off by saying he should ask God. Amen? It doesn't say you got to walk around the walls of Jericho seven times blasting a trumpet, right? doesn't say spin on your head ten times. No. All it says is ask. That's it. You want direction? Ask. Amen? And there's so many verses like this in the Bible, right? I just took a couple, but it makes it so clear that God wants to help us, right? And He wants to help us live the life that He asks of us. Amen? So He hasn't called us into a relationship only to leave us in the dark about how that relationship should unfold, right? So be in no doubt that God wants what is best for you and that he promises to guide us. Amen? Tell your neighbor, he promises to guide us. All right, so 
the next pressing question. How does God guide us? Okay? Okay, so, you've accepted, hopefully, that God has made this promise, right? But the question then becomes how. How does God guide us? How does God guide me? Well, let's see what the Bible says. We're going to go back to the verse that we read earlier in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. Someone read. In all your words, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Amen. So if you want your paths to be directed, you have to? Acknowledge him. Is that difficult? Right? Is that difficult? It's so insane that the instructions to us are so easy and so simple, yet we don't do them. And we make life so complicated. Right? See, over the years, you know, um, we've, I've asked this question, you know, how will he give, you know, how will he give us his wisdom? Right? I've asked many people this. I've asked many Christians. I've heard lots of sermons on it. And, you know, I've heard many Christians give lots of different answers to this question as to how he'll give us his wisdom. So, you know, sometimes you'll hear messages on guidance that talk about the doors, you know, the doors will open, doors will close, right? Um, and then, you know, or about things that you can do to test out the different options for which you are to choose, right? Uh, about the importance of the counsel of Christian friends and elders, you know, or about the feelings of peace, you know, you may have about a decision. Now, as much as all that stuff can be helpful and it can be important, right? But sometimes we just got to use common sense. Amen? See, if I fail at math and the university's admission board won't let me into an engineering course, then that is probably a clear sign that I should not be pursuing engineering, right? But you know, what worries me a lot is, and, and, and I see this all the time, when people ask for guidance, people ask for, you know, from, from people, you know, what, how should I listen to God? You know, sometimes we undermine God when we give instructions or we give direction. Now we're gonna look at something that Paul wrote. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter three, uh, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is God's read. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. So, all scripture is? God's read. Amen. No one, no one cares. <laughs> all right. So, all scripture, the Bible that you hold and you, you rely on so much, it is God breathed. Amen. It's inspired by God. And then it says that it's profitable for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen? So that means that if you want to do good things in your life and you want to do what God wants you to do, all you need is this. All you need is a Bible. Right? Some people say, if I had a million dollars, right? And then they'd be like, I will, you know, go get an orphanage, I will feed people, I will do this. But the Bible says all you need is the Bible. Amen? If you want to do good things and you want to do good works and you want to see your life be a blessing to others, all you need to do is read the Bible. Amen? And the thing is, though, that doesn't mean that, you know, if we want to find out what God wants us to do or decisions, you know, that, you know, it's going to be written in there like a, like a textbook, right? That you can ask a specific question. Should I buy a Lamborghini Murcielago? And it's not like in Genesis chapter 6 verse 2, it says, do not buy a Lamborghini. No, it doesn't work like that. Amen? But, see, if we t sometimes people take this the wrong way, right? And some people think that the Bible's like a gigantic fortune cookie, right? And you just sort of open the Bible in the morning, you know, you've never read the Bible, you sort of read the Bible here and there, and you're suddenly faced with a hard decision, you decide, I'm going to read the Bible and see what it says. Well, the Bible's uh, pretty big, you know. The chances of you landing on exactly what you should be reading is, is very slim, right? And, you know, uh, you may have heard of the story. You know, I heard of a, a young man who was uh, once uh, tried to use the Bible like that, right? And he randomly opened it to a page with his eyes closed and let his finger pick out a verse on the page, right? And he got to this verse. It says, in Matthew 27, 5, Judas went and hung himself, right? And he thought, well, that's not really helpful. So he thought, let me repeat the process. So again, he opened the Bible in and he came to this verse. It said, go and do likewise, <laughs> right? It doesn't work like that, right? I mean, it sounds funny, but Christians do that. They think that the Bible, that they just open up to any verse anyway, it's like, oh, maybe this is what I should be doing today. You know? That's not the way God works. Ask the neighbor, how does God work? And tell them, we're going to find out. Okay, so, what then does the Bible say about how God guides us, right? We're going to look quickly 
into the book of Colossians uh, in chapter 3. And we're going to find three principles in there and I will end. So, three things we find in that chapter are this. Number one, keep your eyes on the prize. Number two, keep your feet on the path. Number three, keep your heart at peace with Christ. Amen? So we're going to find these three things in the chapter 3 of Colossians. So, uh, the first one, eyes on the prize, which the Bible talks about in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. See, one thing you got to know is that God cares about every single detail of our lives, right? Not just the big stuff, not just when you go and, and perform a miracle or you go and you do something. God cares about every single thing that you do, amen? The fact that you had a good night's sleep, hey, God cares about that. The fact that you can breathe properly, you can breathe well, and you can walk, God cares about that. Amen? Every single detail, God cares about, right? Because, why? He wants to help us to negotiate the path to heaven. Amen? You see, me and God, we share a common goal, okay? We both want to see each other in heaven together, right? And whether you like it or not, every single decision that you make from now till the day that you die affects that goal. Amen? Either you're moving towards that goal or away from it. Amen? And in, in Colossians, Paul urges us to set our hearts and minds on the prize that awaits us when Christ returns in glory. Everything we do in our life now should be done with our eyes on the prize. Amen? So that means that when we are faced with decisions that have to be made, God's guidance is that we choose things that will be positive for us spiritually. Amen? That will help us on our journey to our real home. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Which means that we should be rejecting choices that hinder our journey. Right? Let me put it this way. Say, for instance, you want to buy a car. It's me. It's a car. I want to get a Ferrari 458G. Okay, this is going on. All right, so I want to get this Ferrari, and everything I do from now till I get the Ferrari is either going to take me towards that Ferrari or away from that Ferrari. So my friends call me and say, hey, listen, uh, Fast and Furious 8 is out. You know, let's go watch that movie together. You want to come? Uh, it's going to cost about 20 bucks, 25 with popcorn drink. You know, if I go, am I going further away from my Ferrari or towards my Ferrari? I'm going away, right? So every single decision that we make is taking us either towards our goal or away from our goal, right? So if, we're, if, if our goal is heaven and our goal is God and our eyes are on that prize, then every single decision that we make should be, is it going to get me closer to heaven or further away from heaven? <laughs> Amen? Tell your neighbor, keep your eyes on the prize. Okay, number two. Keep your feet on the path. And that you will read about in verses 5 to 14 in that same chapter. So, Paul then goes on to argue that if we're heading in the direction of heaven, then we should actually walk on the path that takes us in that direction. Right? And this is the attitude of God's chosen people. Amen? Look at your neighbor. Are you God's chosen people? Are you sure? Right? Then this is our attitude. Keep your feet on the path. Amen? So, in other words, choose what is right. Okay? Now, we wrote, if you're taking notes, feet on the path, you can also put in brackets, common sense. And this is where common sense comes into play. Um, you know, we got to choose what is right. Right? That's how you keep your feet on the path. Right? If you're faced with a decision that has a right decision and a wrong decision, I mean, the choice is clear. Right? Um, you know, my best friend is offering me some drugs. Right? Or... You know, should I tell my boss that my coworker is stealing? Um, should I cheat on that test? Uh, should I lie to my children? Should I stop swearing? Should I get a credit card when I don't have a job? Uh, come, right? There's a right decision and there's a wrong decision. It's pretty simple, right? I mean, isn't the decision so clear? Isn't it? Isn't it? Or is it? You know? Why is it so hard to decide to do the obvious right thing, right? And yet we fall and, 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 and sin constantly in our lives, right? And the answer is so obvious in front of us, right? See, when you're faced with the choice between something that is morally wrong and something that is morally right, 
then God's guidance for you is common sense. Amen? That's why we have it, right? Choose the thing that is right, not the thing that is easy. Amen? Sometimes it won't be easy, especially when it's a decision that has effects on other people who might fight back or take some sort of retaliation against us. But let's say this together. Be clear. All right. Be clear that God will only ever guide you to decide something that is morally right. Amen? Amen? Why? Because God wants nothing but good things for us. Amen? So, the second principle that we looked at is the guidance to make sure that our decisions keep us, keep our feet on the path of life. Amen? Next is, keep our hearts at peace with Christ. Okay? And this is where things get to another level now. Okay? I mean, you know, when we're faced with a decision, we can, you know, read the Bible and, and get decision, you know, advice from there. Um, and then, you know, we can also make sure that we make the right decisions, we don't make the wrong decisions to keep our feet on the path and that we don't slip. But the next one is making sure that our hearts are at peace with Christ. This one is a bit more complicated. And we can find out about that in verse 15 and 17 of Colossians 3. Um, you know, the final principle is to make decisions based upon Christ's peace ruling in our hearts. Okay? So this isn't talking about a forced feeling of being at peace about a decision. Instead, it is talking about the peace that we know in our hearts. When our daily lives are in tune with the friendship that we have with Jesus. Right? So, I mean, can you truly say that you are at peace with God after making the decision? If you can, then it is, then it is a decision that you can truly say resulted from following God's guidance. Right? So when you're making the right decision, your heart will be at peace with God. Right? But that only happens if Christ is in your heart in the first place, right? If you don't have a relationship with Christ, then you don't have this ability. You don't have this sense that the Holy Spirit will speak to you and, and, and tell you what to do, right? You don't have the Spirit of God in your heart, right? And if you don't have the Spirit of God in your heart, then how can you know if you should or shouldn't do something, right? Now, don't raise your hands up when I ask these questions, but... Just reflect on your own life and see if you can answer them. How many of you really do have a relationship with Christ? Think about it. How many of you feel Him in here right now? How many of you know that the Holy Spirit is talking to you right now? How many of you know that the Holy Spirit is constantly fighting for you and speaking for you and casting away demonic forces for you right now? How many of you can say that God is in full control of your heart today? So you might be thinking about a decision this morning that you're facing. And it's possible that you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute. Those three things, those three rules, you know, rule out some of the choices that I have to make, but it doesn't seem to rule out all of them. I mean, I'm still in the dark about what God is guiding me to do. I mean, should I do... Option A or B or C. Um, I want to say to you that in many instances, there are going to be several choices that are all within the realm of God's guidance. Right? He doesn't care for you. You might be looking for a new job. You rule out a couple of options because they contradict, you know, biblical principles and you don't want to do it. But you still have a choice of two or three jobs left. Right? And a lot of people would keep fretting about not yet having received God's guidance about what to do. But I want to tell you that in that case, you really should be rejoicing. If God's clear leading results in you having a couple of choices, then there is nothing wrong with you going with the one that you prefer. Amen? Think about it. God is your creator as well as your savior. Amen? And if he made you with a liking for engineering over medicine or laboring instead of office work, and there's no spiritual or moral reasons to favor one job over the other, then go with the one you'd like best. Because that is the wonderful, amazing, majestic, all-powerful, loving, and beautiful Father that you have. Amen? And I can stand here and I can tell you that I've tasted that part of God, 
And I've seen it, I've felt it, I've experienced, and I saw His goodness in my life. Amen? Hallelujah. So, in conclusion, um, let's read this verse. The Apostle Paul, that wrote that, has summed up what we just read in one verse. So, verse 17, it says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through Him. Amen. In all you do. See, everything we do, we are doing it as a representative of God here on earth. Right? So, that means that we act in His name. We talk in His name. We think in His name. Right? When we have choices to make, we've got to choose the ones that represent Him the best. Amen? The ones for which we can give Him thanks. Amen? We can't go wrong if these are our guiding principles. Again, keep your eyes on the prize, keep your feet on the path, and keep your heart at peace with Christ. Amen? Why don't we all stand to our feet, and we will spend a few moments in prayer, and then we will close. I want you to do some self-reflection. Look into your life. This message is not for the person standing beside you. It's for you. Don't think that this is for someone else. This doesn't apply to me. No, this is for every single one of us, myself included. We all make decisions every single day. We chose what to wear this morning. We chose how to get here in the morning. We chose what time to put our alarm clocks at. We chose... You know, if we're going to read the Bible this morning or not, we chose if we're going to have breakfast or not. Those are all decisions that you made. If you're driving, you chose which parking spot to park in outside. These are all decisions that you're making. We all make decisions. But sometimes when you're at work and you're faced with a big decision, something that could alter your life, alter what you have to do or, or how things work in your life, you need to turn to God. And sometimes you'll find that decisions or choices are thrown at you just out of the blue. And, and you need to make a decision right then and there. Someone offers you something right there. It's like, you want to take it right now? You can't turn away and say, you know what, let me pray about it for five days and come back. No, that's where the relationship with Christ comes in. So in that decision, any choice that comes up that's on the spot, the Holy Spirit inside you instantly tells you what to say, what to do, and to get out of there. So if you're looking for direction in your life, you want to make sure you're making the right decisions. You want to make sure that you've got your feet on that path and that you're not deviating from it. You're not going away from God's will. First and foremost, you have to have that relationship with God. You gotta talk to Him every day. You gotta be with Him every day. Why is it so easy and yet so hard to do? Sometimes the choice is so clear and yet we choose sin over life. When opportunities come our way, we, we're, we're choosing death over life when we give in to the devil. When you sit and talk about it, it sounds crazy. But when we're in that moment, we're doing it. We're choosing to lie. We're choosing to swear. We're choosing to cheat. We're choosing death over life. So I want you to look deep inside your life. Look deep inside your heart. And I asked the question earlier, do you know, can you truly say that God is in full control your heart today and if not there's a wonderful thing about God it's never too late it's never too late so I want you to give your heart into God's hands fully into God's hands yes there might be some black spots in there yes there might be some pain in there might be some hurt in there some resentment in there some sadness, some depression. But trust me, just give it to God. Give it to God first. And give Him all of it, and your life will turn around. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. There's no point in me saying it and you just saying amen. You have to open up your mouth and you got to tell God, God, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I give you my mind. I give you everything, Lord God. I give you my, my powers to, take, to make decisions, Lord God. I give it all into your hands, Lord God. I want to be on your path, Lord God. I want to hear your still small voice everywhere I go, Lord God, so that I know exactly what I need to do, Lord. Come on, open up your mouth and just speak to him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord God.